Okay. Thank you, Kevin. Um, the report we produce, there's probably about four or five big messages. And the four or five big messages start from the, the headline one, which is on the slide there, that says that when you look at the magnificent database which has been put together by colleagues at Imperial College, over the, the last 30 years, or slightly less than 30 years, the numbers of people who are overweight and obese in the developing world has trebled. And we're rapidly approaching the point where we've got almost twice as many people in the developing world who are overweight and obese compared to those in the high-income countries. So a problem that we once thought as being a problem of rich countries is now much, much more broadly there. It's part of the developing world agenda, although, of course, most of those people who are overweight and obese will be found in the emerging economies, the middle-income economies, rather than the low-income economies. Point number two, the reason that we're getting this trebling of overweight and obese is we've got lots of different factors there, and we can argue about the salience of the factors, but we don't argue about the sorts of things that matter. And on the scratch pad are the importance of higher incomes, which allows the emerging middle class to choose a diet purely on the basis of taste rather than the limitations of budget and that's seeing people move to more livestock products, more fruit, vegetable, more dairy products, more fish, and so on, but included in that quite a lot more processed foods and quite a lot more foods which are rich in their content of fat and rich in their content of sugar. We're also seeing you know, a triumph of the, of, of the food industry in, in which um, cheap, accessible, easy to prepare, convenience foods are available to eat at home or, or are outside of the home uh, very easily across the urbanizing developing world. We're seeing the influence of advertising and media in film and television which is transmitting new ideas about what a, what a desirable diet may be and we've got increasingly sedentary lives <coughs> in most of the middle-income countries as people move from the manual labour of the fields uh, into services um, using up much less energy. And the conflation of those factors has resulted in the expanding waistlines that we're seeing at the moment. Now, we shouldn't exaggerate the globalising forces. The globalising forces are, are there the general pattern of a, new, uh, of, of a nutritional transition from dependence on staples to a more varied diet, to a diet with a lot more livestock in it, that can be seen everywhere. But there are some very, very large regional variations. This is a map put together and on the basis of this rather large database from colleagues at, at Imperial and, and their colleagues across the world. And what you're looking at there is a map of the world for 2008. That is the prevalence of overweight and obese adult females in the world. If we looked at the male one, it wouldn't look very different. And what you're seeing there, if you look across the developing world, is there are very great variations. Latin America, with Mexico as the unfortunate poster child for Latin America in this respect, some parts of the Middle East, such as Egypt, and some Pacific Islands were seeing very high weight rates of overweight and obesity. Two out of three, if not more, persons overweight and obese in, in these countries. Yet there are other parts of the developing world, of the middle income world, particularly in Southeast Asia, South Asia, and parts of East Asia, where the incidence is running at about half the level that we're seeing in those other areas. Now what that tells us if we're seeing that much variation, is there are different pathways. And whilst waistlines may be expanding across the world, the rate of expansion and the degree of expansion is different, so there must be lessons to be learned from the countries with lower incidence compared to those with higher prevalence. On policy, the news is not good. Unlike undernutrition, where we know pretty much what is needed to be done to reduce incidence of undernutrition and where the statistics are moving, <coughs> albeit too slowly, in the right direction, 
for overnutrition nowhere in the world has stemmed the rising tide of obesity. Um, the policies which have been taken by countries have been at best cautious, perhaps better labelled, frankly, quite timid. Uh, and as a result, we don't have a lot in the, in the tool chest where we can say this will definitely work. We're still, in this, we're still at the stage where we're saying we need to evaluate policies, we need to try out a wider range of policies, combinations of policies to find out what may work. And that question of what may work is something that I hope we may hear a little more about today um, from my companion speakers. Thanks very much, Steve. Steve, be before I pass on, let, let me just ask you one question, if I could, uh, by way of follow-up. Um, you, you know, as, as you say, that one of the central messages of the report, you know, is that you know we're, we're facing these huge challenges, but the responses have been very timid. D does the, in your view, uh, and I realise we're speaking in generalisations a bit here, but d does the timidity of the response reflect a lack of evidence or uncertainty about evidence? Or does it reflect a political economy of, you know, of decision making in government? Uh, I'd say it's certainly not a lack of evidence. Um, the evidence we have here, we've, we've had similar evidence for 20 or 30 years. The World Health Organization has talked about this. It's held conferences. Um, I think probably one of, one of the biggest factors we've got here is, is it's a slowly rising po uh, problem and it doesn't result in headline-making disasters. There's no, there's no moment that it creates a threshold of activity where a politician wakes up and says, we have to do something about this tomorrow. People are aware, but it's, it, it, it just doesn't grab the priority. Okay, thanks, Steve.